Good afternoon to everyone in America and good night to everyone calling in from Europe. My name is Eris Cohen and I'm the Executive Director of Hillel at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We are very happy to be hosting this event with the University of Illinois program in Jewish culture and society. We have a long list of co-sponsors, including the Illinois Holocaust Museum, the Jewish United Fund, Peoria, Springfield, the Quad Cities, and the St. Louis Jewish Federations, Hillel's from NYU, Hobart and Smith Colleges, Virginia, um, the Michigan Hillel, the Alliance of uh, Hillel's at Michigan, Poland, Hunter College, Latin America Hillel's, Rochester, Syracuse, Arizona, the Slavic and the Slavic Languages and Literature Program in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Diversity at the University of Illinois, as well as Sinai Temple in Champaign-Urbana. We were able to do this uh, program with support from the Champaign-Urbana Jewish Federation and the Allen Fund at the Champaign-Urbana Jewish Endowment Foundation. Uh, yesterday, we heard from uh, Carolina Ushuk and today we will hear from Camille Karski. I uh, I want to say just a uh, just make a personal note that it's an extremely exciting moment for me to see this event come come to fruition. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, I traveled to uh, to Poland to do some research about my family, and I met with Camille and Karolina, and uh, they they gave me a tour of Plashov, which. Uh, which you will get today in a, a little bit of a different format. And it was um, a unique opportunity for me to see um, the place where my great, great grandfather was murdered. And uh, I'm just, um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity with the alliance of co-sponsors that we have to really spread the word about Plashov and give some, some more information about um, the Holocaust and and some of the forgotten aspects of the Holocaust. So um, I will I will now introduce Professor George Casina, who is uh, chairing today's event, and he will introduce our speakers. George is an associate professor of Slavic languages and literatures in comparative and world literature at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He researches and teaches in the fields of modern and modern Polish literature, the avant-garde, and, um, and migration and diaspora studies and Jewish-Polish relations. He is presently at work on a book treating 20th and 21st century Polish provincial uh, borderland literature. And Professor Gassina is a 20, 2020 to 2025 Conrad Humanities Professorial Scholar in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Prof Professor Gassin. Thank you so much for this introduction. Uh, so wonderful to see so many people here. I'll just be very brief. It gives me a unique pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Mr. Kamil Karski to you. Um, Kamil Karski is an archeologist after completing his master's degree in 2013, he took part in field work focused on 20th century dark heritage, including research on the First World War and the Second World War in Southern Poland. Since 2017, as an employee of the Krakow Museum, he has coordinated an archeological research project in the area, the, the specific area of, of the former Plaszow concentration camp. Uh, his main interests include the so-called archaeology of the contemporary past, the popularization of research results, also known as community archaeology, and the protection of archaeological cultural heritage. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Karski to this event. And I don't know if you want to clap or if you want to do the German thing and sort of slam on the, on the yeah, clap. Uh, thank, the clap. thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. thank you that you all decided to take part in this event. Uh, it's really important for me. It's a great opportunity to share all my experience uh, on working in the museum and the commemoration of Płaszów. And today I would like to tell something more about our strategy and everything that we are doing. 
uh, with with the commemoration as well. So uh, I divided my presentation um, for four uh, main parts, uh, and I would like to explain who actually we are because I'm here alone, or maybe with together with Carolina, but we are working in a bigger team. Uh, what we would like to do, and then uh, I would like to present you a strategy for commemoration um, of the territory or maybe the history of actually of the victims of and former prisoners of uh, of Płaszów um, that we plan for the next five years. So, okay. Um, so in the beginning, I would like to tell you something more about the context, uh, about our background, because probably some of you heard about the track of Ares, uh, thought some words about it. Uh, it's a city in the Central Europe, really important for the Polish culture, for the Polish identity. It's the former capital of Poland. Uh, it is best uh, known thank, thanks to its architecture, the oldest Polish university, uh, and once a year, just before the COVID, about 14 million of tourists visited a year. So we don't know how it look um, how how it will look uh, in this year, but it's really really popular touristical destination. Nevertheless, it's also a big uh, metropolia, or quite big city right now, about uh, 700 of thousands of residents um, with rich uh, heritage, as I said. So in Europe, probably almost every important city has it, its own museum. We are not an exception. And uh, I'm working in the former uh, known the museum. <laughs> we changed the name. Uh, formerly, it was uh, the historical museum of the city of Krakow. Right now, it's just simply museum of Krakow, and we've got our division, our motto that we are talking about the city from the beginning, from very, very early beginning, but without an end. So, um, the history, but also the presence and the future of our city is also important part of our mission and our. Mm, our work by describing, listening the residents and all what is happening just around us. So we have 19 branches with 19 the exhibitions and it's quite obvious that we have to pay attention on the dark heritage of the Second World War. Right now we made something, a few years ago we made something that we can call the Memorial Path it's a line connecting three branches of our museum. And here you can see the oldest one, the Pomorska Street, which is a former Gestapo headquarters. It's the uh, oldest exhibition dedicated to the Second World War history in our museum. And important part of it are the authentic cells, uh, authentic part of prison of, of Gestapo headquarters. But probably some of you heard about the history of Oskar Schindler, and it's really important to the public debate about the heritage and the war history in Krakow, because thanks to the Thomas Connolly publication Schindler's Ark, and then Steven Spielberg uh, film Schindler's List, this, uh, this history become recognized worldwide. Uh, so Schindler was, of course, a German, Mm, he decided to move in the beginning of the Second World War to Krakow, probably for earning money. But what is important here, despite uh, his, his uh, past, he was able to help more than 1,200 Jewish people who, uh, from Krakow mostly. Mm, he organized their evacuation from Krakow to Brinitz, and we are sure that he actually saved their life or make it possible to save their lives. Um, after the Schindler's, Schindler's List uh, publication and premiere, um, the authorities of Krakow decided to arrange a museum. Right now it's a 
in the British Museum of the Memorial Park. Uh, and it's located in the former administrative building and exhibition presented there is about the whole Second World War, but told from the perspective of residents of Krakow. It's a Krakow under the Nazi occupation. And actually it's really important to show the big, even the, the big history through the lens of, of the small city actually uh, in, in Central Europe. And experiencing the exhibition and visiting this museum is quite unique because it's also narrative and full of multimedia, but also um, a little bit similar to, to other modern museums, like, like for, for example, Museum of Warsaw Rising in Warsaw. So, and probably maybe not the newest museum, but with the newest exhibition is uh, Eagle Pharmacy. Uh, and the exhibition there is dedicated to the ghetto history of the, uh, is dedicated to the Krakow uh, ghetto history. It's located in the ghetto historical um, area. Uh, and was owned by Tadeusz Pankiewicz, the Pole, uh, writing news among the nations, but it wasn't simply the chemist inside the ghetto. It was a spot where people were, were changing their uh, things, they were talking, it was a meeting point. Uh, also, they smuggled some medicals and other stuff inside and outside the ghetto to the Aryan side. But uh, this path is actually incomplete without one place. Right now we are looking in the area of the former camp um, es established in 1942. Right now it looks like a green area, like a innocence park or something like that. Without the knowledge about it, its past, it's just beautiful landscape somewhere in the city, just surrounded just by the blocks of flats. And right now we are looking on the modern, on the contemporary, um, contemporary map of Krakow. And here we can see how it looks like in the space. Uh, the first uh, branch of the museum that I said is the Pomorska, it's here. The second Schindler's factory, Eagle Pharmacy, and this gray, actually green area here is the, the um, relics or the campscape uh, of Prashov. Here I also noted the most important, uh, the most important locations in, in the history of Krakow, the old town founded in the Middle Ages, right now it is still the city center. The Kazimierz district, popularly known as the Jewish quarter of Krakow, and the ghetto on the opposite bank of Vistula River. And who actually we are? So, uh, walking in the commemoration is quite complicated because I called the core team. I'm a member of, of, of this team. We are walking um, together. I am walking together with three other people. And what we have to do, we uh, are coordinating all walks, all scientific walks, but also the investment and the plans for commemoration. We are making our research and education, which is probably the most important thing to do uh, in the memorial place. But we are not alone, actually. We've got a scenario team, the people who involved, to, for example, with Carolina and experts from our museum and academics. And together we are working on scenario and strategy of the future exhibition of the memorial site. Um, I will tell you a few words in a few minutes about uh, how, it, how we would like to, to make it. And the second part is also our research as a team incomplete. And also we've got something that we called social council with an experts uh, heads of other uh, memorial sites, but also the survivors, the veterans, experts in education, and so on. Um, so we are working together to make, uh, to verify our ideas, um, our research uh, for, for best 
result. So the next question, and probably during my presentation, it will be the most important, what and who we want to commemorate. So there will be a little bit of the history, but really briefly, uh, officially the Second World War started in the beginning of the September, September of 19, uh, 1939. And what is important here, the West part of Poland was directly incorporated into Third Reich, but the central part of Poland um, was changed into something that is, was dependent state called general government. Kraków became the capital of the city. Um, it is complicated because of its historical background because Nazi Germans decide, decided that Kraków is, in German we could say, Urgeschichte Deutsche, so it means um, historically German. Yeah, it is true, partially, of, of course, because in the Middle Ages, a lot of German, uh, Germans uh, lived in Krakow and the German community was quite vivid there. But uh, of course, time changed. And what we have to, what we can talk about the uh, Second World War here, here you can see a photo with the royal castle uh, with a probably most important cathedral, Roman Catholic cathedral uh, also in Poland. And this castle became a um, resident of Hans Frank here in, the, here in the picture below that was the head of general government. Also the um, city space underwent important changes because uh, the propaganda was really important part of oppression, actually. Here you can see the building called, um, building under the chimneys in the Krakow Market Square. So the mine, um, mine piazza inside the city with, with a swastika. And also the building of the Technical University in Krakow that was changed into a general government parliament. And there's a lot of photography, you know, that the taking uh, pictures was quite popular among the German, uh, German soldiers. Uh, please please uh, keep in your mind just this picture. I will tell you something more in the future. But what I would like to also show here on this aerial photography dated from the 1942 is uh, Kazimierz. As I said, it was a Jewish district, so-called Jewish district. The part uh, that was um, surrounded by the fence in 1941, like here and here, that is a Krakow ghetto. Um, and here, just in the next the edge of the frame, you can see a part of Warsaw's camp. You can see that the distances are not far away, um, and probably. Many people are able right now to go by foot from the Kazimierz to get to the former ghetto and to see the concentration camp also. Uh, what is important here, and I would like to stress it uh, really, I would like to stress it really, because um, Rashov has its own specifics. Uh, some prisoners, some some survivors even told that the Plashov was a continuation of Krakow Ghetto. Uh, it was like the next step of the final step of Jewish community of the city. Before the war, 70,000 of Jewish people lived in the Krakow. Uh, just before the liquidation of Krakow Ghetto in March 1940, Three, um, about 10,000 live there. Here we can see one of the pictures um, during the so called in German Aktion or in Polish Aktion. So the replacement of the people from the ghetto, they are just leaving the fenced area of the ghetto and they are forced to go to the railway station. Most of them died in Bauschitz extermination camp. In the history of the Krakow ghetto, we have to mention that uh, most deportation 
took, took, took place in June and in October 1942 to um, Bauritz, and then the only one during the li final liquidation in March 1943 to Auschwitz. About 2,000 of people were deposited there, and the rest, about the 8,000 of people, were transferred to the Plashov. I mentioned that pictures because it's really important here in this context because uh, it's uh, the circumstances when where we get this uh, are really interesting because it's a part of an album and one of the tourists uh, from Germany decided to give his family heritage to us because uh, I think it was a grandfather property he was the grandfather was of, uh, of course the german soldier um, that uh, and he took a lot of pictures of krakow during the second world war but here we can see the german officer standing in the jewish cemetery and for a few months we supposed that it's a jewish cemetery in krakow somewhere probably uh, in podgorze district we have to in the mind that uh, the Plashov was established in the area of two Jewish cemeteries, the old one and the new one. And for a long time, we thought that it is one of this cemetery. But last year, uh, accidentally, we found the, um, the offer uh, of, uh, for buyers on the German eBay with uh, this, those collect, this collection of the pictures and right now we are quite sure that um, our um, our suggestion that the picture that I showed you formerly uh, is in Plashov because thanks to this picture we can see that these four collections are definitely from Plashov. The camp was established and right now there will be a part about the, the camp itself. Uh, the camp was established uh, in 1942 in October and German authorities decided that it will be for four or five thousand of Jews from Krakow ghetto after the displacement and final liquidation. Uh, we them, mm, and this picture was taken probably in the spring of 1943 and there's another story just behind this image image because um, those three people are polish people uh, and um, i think the grandson of this man uh, gave this photograph to us to the museum and told that they are bystanders but they decided to stand right here to take uh, the picture of everything that is in the background. So actually the camp and the uh, beginning of the construction of barracks here. Here you can see also the funeral parlor of, of new cemetery that was also in the previous pictures. Everything changed in the March of 1943 after the final liquidation of Krakow ghetto. Uh, you remember that I told you that um, Nazi authorities decided that it will be for far it will, that the camp will be for five or four thousand of people. In March of 1943, uh, more than ten thousand of Jewish people lived behind the barbed wire. Here, the small camp became like a small city, but it was changing right now in 1944. Here you can see that it's an enormous area of uh, 80 hectares, about 20 buildings uh, were in this area. And in September of 1944, about uh, 20,000 of prisoners lived here. Uh, who were the prisoners? Mostly they were Jewish people. 
from Krakow or from the smaller sites, smaller ghettos in general government. What is typical for this place that there is no a lot of prisoners from different countries. It was typical for it was typical typical spot point uh, in the local meaning and the local connections. So um, right now we estimate that uh, during the whole operating of of Palash of Camp about thirty five thousand of people passed through it. Uh, the Poles were also uh, the um, prisoners, even if I get back, and there was a sub camp inside the camp uh, called the re-education camp for Poles, um, because here in this step it was like, a, it, it was a forced labor camp and in the beginning of 1944 it was transferred, it was changed in the concentration camp. Then in the important change, changes took place also in the administrative structure. What determined determined the campscape is uh, are actually three mass uh, execution sites. The first one was more or less here. The second one here, and the third one here. There was no gas chambers. The people were uh, shooted. And, and there was no crematory. Uh, all the bodies were buried in the ground. And in the second part of 1944, when the decision that the camp must be liquidated uh, was made, also um, the bodies was exhumed and burned and the ashes of the victims were spread just around on the camp area. Uh, what is really important in, in our spatial reconstruction is that we have uh, uh, amazing archival sources. We've got four blueprints of Palashov from different years, from different stage, stages of its operation. We've got also a real photography from the um, National Records Archive in the Washington. Uh, most of them are Germans from the Luftwaffe, but there are some from uh, Allianz like this one took in August 20, 1944. And uh, I will tell you something more about the pictures because probably it's the best uh, source of information right now for reconstruction of flash of um, how it looks like. Um, we've got a collection, we've got an access to collection of about 250 photographs took mo mostly in the second part of the 1944 and thanks that we are able to reconstruct how it looks like. We also have got two films uh, made just behind the barbed wire by the soldier of Polish under underground uh, from the um, September 1944 and the January 1945, just after the um, evacuation of German troops from Krakow. Here we can see the, uh, the film, the, the part from the January, there is a snow. And uh, there is a, also a breakboard with the information that taking a photograph is absolutely prohibited. Uh, and also the funeral pearl, as I mentioned, probably that's the best um, best recognized object inside inside the camp. But what is more important? Ah, was maybe uh, only a small remark. There was no liberation. The last group of prisoners were forced to the uh, to the death march uh, to the Auschwitz just a few days before Krakow was so-called liberated by the uh, Russian army, the Red Army. And right now it looks like that. Here we've got the photo panorama made from the authentic original photos from the 1944. 
till the funeral pearl is preserved only in this spot. And right now it's a beautiful landscape overbeat partially with the block of flats, restaurants, fast food and so on. But uh, what we would like to commemorate, not the landscape, not the, not the space, we want to commemorate the people because many of them were the residents of Krakow, we lived with the same places uh, where we are living. Uh, they have their, their own um, thoughts, their own dreams. And for example, the best motto for us during our work uh, are the words of uh, Henrik Zimmermann, um, the former prisoner of Lashov also. So many different hopes and dreams were united by those sentenced to the death in Nazi extermination camps or concentration camps as well. The most important last dreams at the end of life was that we, or at least some of us, would survive and be able to tell the world about this terrible truth of genocide. Uh, what we are doing? Uh, so there is uh, three probably most important pillars of our activity right now, because there is no museum permanent exhibition. Mm, we are making this kind of activity as at the beginning, probably the most important is documentation and preservation uh, of, of the history of the camp and its survivors and prisoners uh, and victims. Uh, here you can see Bernard Offen, a uh, survivor of Płaszow and other um, concentration camps, an amazing person uh, and a great educator. When he's showing uh, apple plats and are talking uh, and he's talking about his experience uh, in Plash of Camp. We also preserved the area, for example, here on this slope, we put a metal net uh, to avoid the activity of wild animals because it's a part of the cemetery also. Mm, we are documenting, uh, listing all the architectural relics because Many people thought that the campscape is an empty area. Mm, it isn't. There's a lot of traces like this one from the one of Barak. And probably the most important, that's the reason why we met with Ares. Mm, we, in the contrast to the other memorial site, we don't have an archive. The archive were completely destroyed in the end of the 1944 and the beginning of 1945. Here you can see the photograph took by the historical commission and a lot of papers, a lot of documents are just spread away and partially destroyed. So right now we made some project called Digital Archive of Karl Plashov and it will become, we hope so, the basic source of information for anybody about the prisoners, also about the camp staff, about the photographs, documents, testimonies, uh, literature and uh, scientific information and about the artifacts. We also made uh, uh, archaeological research. This is a part of my field actually. Mm, and what is important here, mm, we want to confirm all our historical records, but the digging inside the place of genocide is really uh, sensitive or really difficult through the ethics and emotion. At the first of all, we decided we want to dig uh, the place of the cemeteries or the mass graves. We just want to get know some and gather information about the camp, about its structures, but without disturbing the peace of people murdered, murdered in this place uh, and resting, uh, and uh, who are resting there. We are working together with the Rabbinical Commission um, in the um, office of Chief Rabbi of Poland. Um, and what is the result? So we examined only 1,600 square meters, um, and it's here is a comparison, it's only 0.2% of the Plashovs area in August 1944. But during those research, we found more than 
13,000 of artifacts, among them a lot of personal belongings of the victims, which are, which are probably <clears throat> most effective and uh, evocative part um, and trace of, of human presence in this area just eight years ago. And finally, education. Here you can see a plan of the funeral parlor and our 3D print. Uh, it, we would like to use it, but we printed it, it in, in the half of this year. So we are uh, unable to do it due to the COVID. And, but uh, we make a lot of uh, sightseeing, or as we can say, maybe not tours. It, there's not good words to, to describe it. We are walking and experiencing the memorial site, how it looks like right now, how, it, uh, how its history was written in this area. Like this one with, with the map. Uh, and also we are working with youth from the Krakow schools here in the Schindler's factory. Uh, how to create a memorial? The idea is simple. Uh, there, is, there are four main parts. The most important is the campscape. We treat it as a, uh, as a witness of the history, so we don't want to change it. So the, the presence of this place is important part uh, or, or important uh, for, for, the for the understanding, sorry, uh, it's past. Uh, we would like to make a new building with a permanent or core exhibition uh, and it will be outside the campscape, but next the border. Uh, there is one building that preserved in, in uh, preserved camp area. It's a great house. It was a part of the Jewish cemetery during uh, the Second World War, during the, the camp was operating, it was uh, used for offices. It's called the Grey House. And a sound monument as a fourth part. Uh, Karina talked a lot about it uh, yesterday. So, so we made a basic, um, basic path. But some people will go from this side, some people will go from this side. Um, the area of the memorial will be completely accessible for anyone without any tickets uh, and so on. We would like to uh, make some small markers. Right now there is an open air museum with the photographs. We'd like to put some more uh, with a basic, really basic in historical information in three languages, probably maybe not probably, I'm sure they will be in Polish, English and in Hebrew, but also the part of uh, commemoration, commemoration will be as really small markers in the place where the architectural relics or leveling of the earth or the traces uh, of the camp infrastructure are visible, would like to make only short information. For example, here was the kitchen. Uh, here was the barrack number 24 and so on. And that's all. Um, how it looks like, um, like uh, here, right now, here is a gray house. The memorial will be more or less here and the camp area is colored. Um, and our, our uh, <clears throat> core exhibition, permanent exhibition, will be here. You, here you can see uh, the blue line that is uh, overline of the um, camp's border in 1944, the preserved area here, the mass graves and killing sites that are most important uh, in, in, in this landscape, together with the Jewish cemeteries here. Uh, and here will be the permanent exhibition. He would like to make um, or present a most important task uh, typical for the old commemoration of the concentration camps, but what will be unique, uh, of course, the 
um, the link between the camp and the city because it's, it, it was on the suburb of the city. Um, and also the important part of this exhibition will be the post-war period because sometimes in many memorials the liberation is the end of the narration in the exhibition. Here, as I said just before, we think that the present state, the present condition is a great opportunity to ask many questions uh, and to understand the historical circumstances, circumstances sorry, how it would, it would be non-invasive just below the ground level. So, and the Grey House, there will be an exhibition uh, dedicated or maybe not dedicated because both exhibitions and whole memorial is dedicated to the prisoners, victims, um, and victims of Plashov. But here in this building, because it's authentic, we would like to present the history of the camp uh, by using the testimonies uh, much more than uh, it would be possible in the memorial. Uh, that would be presented in the um, basement and in the first floor and in the second floor there will be a special space for contemplation for um, working with emotion uh, in the silence uh, for thinking about the experiencing the memorial site and also in this building we plan the place for working with the archives that we are collecting right now and that's the view from the 50s or the beginning of 60s. The grey house is here. The rest of the funeral parlor and the campscape complete, was completely empty at that time. And finally, that's the end. Uh, I have to mention it that the, all our works in the museum and the future commemoration are co sponsored and, or co funded by the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage of Poland and the municipality of Krakow. Thank you for your attention. Uh, sorry for all my mistakes and misunderstandings in English. Thank you. I would like to uh, to thank Camille again, and uh, I would like to invite um, Brett to um, to uh, facilitate the Q and A section. Uh, Brett is the head of the uh, uh, Brett. I'll, I'll like I likely butcher the the title, so I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself if that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. So uh, yeah, it was so funny. I went to unmute me and then I realized I was not able to and I was like, how do I? <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you so much to Camille and Carolina for these just amazingly rich and interesting presentations yesterday and today. Uh, I've learned so much. Um, I was only in Krakow once and um, it's really just an amazing place. If you haven't had a chance to be there, I don't recommend you travel anywhere right now, but eventually, um, you know, it's, it's really quite a rich and, and incredibly moving place to, to go and visit. I wanna thank Erez and Dara and everybody who worked so hard to um, put this beautiful um, and very moving series of events together. So I'm Brad Ashley Kaplan. I'm the director of the Initiative in Holocaust Genocide Memory Studies, and I also want to thank my colleague and friend Anka Pinkert for being here. Um, she is also, like me, a memory study, memory studies scholar, and um, I'm just very happy to see you all. And Anka, and thank you, George, and thank you, everyone. So, if you have questions, go ahead. If you haven't already, put them in the chat, and then we'll um, we'll see what uh, how much time we have for answers. We maybe will go a little later than four, given how many questions. So, um, so Kathleen is asking about the relationship between Krakow and Plashov. There, there so, yeah, go ahead, mm -hmm. Camille. The relation, so you mean the relation about the residents of, of Krakow uh, 
right now with Plashov or in the history, because it's really complicated. And uh, if you could be more precise, I would be glad. Well, may, there's another question that Dara asks right on the heels of that, and maybe we can answer them both together. Mm -hmm. okay. So Dara says, I understood the maps and photos correctly. There was more distance between the camp and resi residential area at the time. Is that accurate? What do the residents of Krakow yes. generally know or think about the camp? Is that what you meant? So uh, the distance between the residential area in the 1944 was different, actually. Uh, yeah. And even uh, some houses that were incorporated inside the uh, camp were changed for, for the officers or higher rank uh, assessments. Uh, but even in uh, the beginning of 20th century, or maybe in the 40s or 50s, the camps was surrounded somehow uh, with the um, with the houses so that was a good opportunity for the contact with of the people and the prisoners and we have to keep in our mind that the plashov um, camp was only four kilometers from the city center from the main market square and there is right now even the city center you need about i don't know 50 minutes to go by walk from the market square to Plashov, and it wasn't so far. Uh, also, the two main roads, uh, we call it in Polish Wielitska Street, whatever. Uh, it was a main street from Krakow to another city on the suburbs called Wielitska, and people were passing and see the camp. Even uh, Hans Frank uh, noted in one of his diary, or maybe it was not official said, but um, he writes to some of his uh, officers that the Plashov looks like, uh, it, it looks not really good because everywhere, everybody see that demolished space uh, full, uh, full of barracks and it, it, it influenced somehow uh, in the um, Germans' morals as well. People didn't want to see or look at Plashov at the time, uh, but many of them have uh, had the contact with the prisoners for, and we've got a lot of testimonies of prisoners and bystanders or the residents of Krakow about the walking together, about the contact, but not a lot. Uh, we suppose that there is a lot of history histories uh, but not told uh, anyway nevertheless mm, as i said that the education is important part of our duty of, of our walking of, of our work and uh, during these uh, holidays i met uh, a woman who is a daughter um, of women that was uh, throw away for, from her house that become a part of of Camp. So these relations are, are bonded and really important in understanding what Plashov was. I don't know uh, you are satisfied with my answer. Um, yeah, that well, and sort of, there's, a, there's another question also about the geography, and I was interested mm -hmm. in this too, because some of you may, may know that um, the Commandant's house, right, was one of the mm -hmm things that was there. And I, I'm also confused. Someone asked about the relationship between the Grey House and the Commandant's House. And for those of you mm -hmm. who have seen the amazing film, we showed it um, at Hillel, Erez will remember, and Dara too, several years ago that um, our former colleague Chris Benson was involved in making, which is all about the daughter of one of the, yeah, um, yeah of uh, the daughter of Amangat who didn't mm -hmm. know that that was who her father was or what it meant. And she then tries to sort of make this reconciliation with the daughter of a survivor. And it's, you know, it's very interesting how that plays out, but that house features very prominently in that documentary. And I'm wondering what's happened to it and how it figures also mm -hmm. in with the, with the, the plans for the memorial. So I will, sh I will share my screen with you once again. Uh, I will show you this on the on 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 the archival uh, 
parallel photography. So the gray house is here and the commander's villa is here. Mm -hmm. Right now it's private property. And what is really important uh, in a uh, flash of commemoration that many people who want to see the camp are focused on Getz Villa, about his history. And many people go, here is a tram stop right now, just go passing the, the camp's area without any, uh, any information about, they are looking on the, uh, on the commander's villa and they are going away. And that's all. Uh, in our works, in my work also, I'm focusing about the prisoners' history, about their testimonies, their relations, about them, not about the camp stuff. Of course, in the testimonies, get is probably the most common motive, the most common information, but that's not the whole information about it. And uh, finally, um, I made a lot of uh, sightseeing or, or guided tours in this area, and many many people were surprised that the campscape is so big, because they were mm -hmm. mostly next to the Gets Villa or the Bridges Commemoration. You can see it um, on the on the introduction film here. Uh, it's an official name, Monument of the Victims of Fascism. So yeah, uh, right now it is a private property and we are unable to, to make, a, um, make a memorial there. But we think that the better option is to memorialize the gray house uh, and to present um, the whole core exhibition here. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Dana asks a question, what brought you into, oh, the screen just changed, sorry. Yes. <laughs> what brought you into this specific work? Have you always had an interest or was there an event or time that brought you into this memorial work? So uh, it's quite amazing because I wrote my MA thesis about the Neolithic period. But I am field archaeologist, so um, there is a lot of things that I passed uh, during my career. Uh, and I, once I focused on the First World War, so-called Great War, um, and the 20th century, so it was a completely different experience for me, because um, the archaeology of the contemporary past is different than the traditional way of thinking about the prehistory, uh, it's it must it it, 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 it is sorry, uh, it is much more uh, tangible, and I I don't know uh, is it the correct word to to describe it, but sometimes you got the opportunity to talk with the people who remember the facts that you are researching on. And, and probably that's the most important. That there is a link between the contemporary past that surrounds me somehow in my field of research on the field of interest. Mm, but oh, okay, I am examining. I, I am examining a material culture, but just behind the nails or maybe the rest of the barracks that I am excavating. There is a human story, and uh, of course, yeah, and that, the prehistory leads, also. But, yeah, that that um, leads perfectly into Lizzie's question, which also came up a little bit yesterday about um, how are the the um, the local community concretely being involved. So you talked about the different teams, mm -hmm. and it seemed like community members were one, but Lizzie's asking more concretely, how are the community mm -hmm. being involved? Yeah. So we also made some kind of thematic uh, sightseeing. And one of, of it is an uh, archaeology of the memorial site. We don't say that the, it's an archaeology of Plash of Khan, but as a memorial. And you can mm, consider this as an archaeology in the traditional way, as excavating using the non-invasive research, but also metaphoric as an archaeological mm, 
discovering the next layers of your memories, of your past, of your own experience. So, um, okay, there's so many more questions. So we'll go a little, a little over four, I think. Um, so Anka asks about. Um, she says very moving projects and difficult negotiation between preservation, excavation, finding evidence, yeah. and where where are the sort of ambiguities? How do you deal with all of the ambiguity that you're encountering as you try to put this together? So the archaeology and the artifacts that we are excavating and the preservation. Uh, it's really important issue. As I said during the presentation, we would like to. Um, we don't like to be aggressive in the camp campscape. Of course, uh, excavations from my field is the final part of the project. We mostly focus on the analysis of aerial photography or using uh, non invasive research like ground penetrating radar like uh, other, for example, um, res electric resensitivity in English. Uh, and so we decided to dig only in this place that we are uh, sure that the result will be important for us. Uh, for example, um, if you are asking about the reconstruction or something like that in the campscape, we we really don't want to reconstruct anything. Mm. So the relics are probably most important trace because the history was there and is still there, but through the authentic uh, campscape. And as I said, I think I said it twice, uh, and I always uh, will repeat it. Uh, the key for understanding clash of history and, for example, why it was not commemorated in the past is a future mm -hmm. and it is a presence. So right now we are here, for example, imagine I'm standing uh, in the middle of Upper Platz and I'm thinking why this place uh, is not commemorated, what happened here, what are the traces, uh, what value could be assignated to the memorial memorial um, that will be done right now with all our reflections with all our things about this place i don't know that i'm answering the question but that's this kind of um, my um, my way of thinking <laughs> yeah well, that's great um we have a question from someone who has a historical relation to this place. Shabsa says, mm -hmm. my father started building the barracks in Pasho, I believe mm -hmm. in March 1942. He was sent to Garishko. George, Camille, Carolina, correct me. I don't know how to. Um, concentration oh, camp looking. in October 1943. Can you discuss these two events? Uh, at the first of all, I will ask for a contact me. Uh, I tried to find something more about the archives that we are have right now, uh, and I will ask about the note and information, for example, to, to provide the information to, to our archives, because it's really important. And I will be really grateful if, if it will be possible. Yeah, building the barracks in 1942, yeah, it is absolutely correct, because uh, I said that the Płaszów was established in the October 1942, but uh, there was some kind of uh, group of people who every day were forced to go from the ghetto to to the camp area, to the future camp area to build the barracks. Then they were going back to the ghetto every day, and uh, in the end of 1942, that was the first group of prisoners. Uh, they were um, forced to live in unfinished barracks, unfinished building in the in the camp area. So, if you, I, I can't find this uh, info this uh, information in the chat. So, I would be really grateful if you can uh, write me a mail and uh, 
we can talk a little bit more about about your family history. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so, to, can Abby, would you be able to put um, Camille's email into the chat or somebody? Thank you so I can much. Put it. Okay, or thank yes. Um, I think we got most of the questions. There's another interesting connection from Lola Han who says that the name of the documentary is Inheritance, which portrays my aunt with the commandant's daughter. Mm -hmm. I don't, that's really quite amazing that you're here and that that's this, you know, that this connection, that there's all the, of these family connections. Um, yeah, the same with Marilyn Goldberg, says that her family were inmates. Oh, wow. I, I missed that. I didn't see that so, in the chat. There's so many things, co they're coming up so fast. Yeah. So that's the reason uh, for me, the, that's the best opportunity to change uh, the information. And that's uh, a great reason for make this kind of, of Zoom meetings. And if you can just contact me, mail me, anyhow, by the heiress or, or the others organizers, I will be really grateful if, if we can talk about the history and, and collect information about your relatives. Uh, because it's really important about uh, for us. It's like a puzzle and sometimes this history are important and support us. And I've got an opportunity to make guides with, with uh, relatives and with heiress, for example. <laughs> but also with the oldest. And that was probably the best time for thinking that my work is somehow important, not only for ma me, and, but for somebody else. Um, and uh, probably, yeah, it is, it, it is important somehow because working with the Holocaust and genocide is sometimes really hard. And we've got a, little, a lot of doubts that we, if we're working properly, uh, if we spend a lot of, if we spend enough uh, time for, for researching and so on, and sometimes you get this meeting and you know that you are doing good your job. And so. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's beautiful. And that's a beautiful way also to end. And I see also Lizzie has family and Marilyn Goldberg is the, the sister of Lola, mm -hmm. whose aunt was featured in Inheritance. So there's lots of family connections. And Robert Silberman asks if you're related to Jan Karski. And I can say that I already asked, and the answer is no, not no, related to I'm Jan not a relative, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Which is something I asked the very, I think the very first time we, we met yeah. over Zoom. So, it's not um, a common name, but uh, yeah, we are, we are not relatives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be quite some yichas if you were. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It is one of the weird and wonderful things about Zoom that we actually get to reach out to people who are not in little old Champaign-Urbana. So we're delighted to see people from all over the world and to see all of these connections manifest. Thank you so much, Camille. Thank you. Carolina, thank you, Eris, thank you, Dara, thank you, Anka, thank you, George, thank you absolutely everyone for being here. And you have um, Camille's email if you want to be in touch with him. And this is being recorded. So this will be made available, I guess, on Hillel website or somewhere eventually. So thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mm, thank you again to our organizers. I hope uh, that we will all meet in Krakow in future. <laughs> I hope very soon. <laughs> so thank you very much. Eventually. <laughs> There's a vaccine, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, the Pfizer invented it. Yeah, we know it. Uh, yeah. And finally, we can move out from Krakow <laughs> right now. So. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Eric.